tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. And become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, friends, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and tonight's episode contains two stories, both of which explore spaces where reality is a little thin, places where, if you're not careful, you might slip through into somewhere else entirely. Or, even worse, maybe something else has already slipped through into our world. We'll begin with Osiris Children's Hospital by Richard Morgan, This story opens with one of the more horrifying things that a person can experience, learning that their child has a fatal heart condition. After months of waiting for a donor with no luck, our protagonist receives a call one day from someone claiming to be able to fix his daughter's heart. Desperate and scared, he agrees, and the lives of his family members will never be the same again. After that, we'll be closing out with Fishing Hole by R.K. Combrink. In this tale, two friends, Chris and Tony, are going fishing to rekindle their fading friendship. The destination is a small fishing hole in the forested wilderness, and it even has a local legend. The Brookville Spaceman supposedly haunts the area, an alien being ejected during a long-ago spaceship crash. The concept of the spaceman is a fun bonus to Chris and a tiring annoyance to Tony, but both of them are about to change their tune. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today you'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author Richard Morgan, I give you... Osiris Children's Hospital. Up until the day my daughter was born, I was caught up in a constant hurricane of drugs and violence, leaving destruction and misery wherever I went. And then there I was in the hospital, my girlfriend in that bed 
exhausted, a nurse handing me this small, crying thing. That tiny little life had no clue how much violence came from the hands that were holding it. It hit me all at once. I had a family. It was like flipping a switch. I wanted to give this child and her mother a better world to live in. I wanted to protect them. I wanted to marry my girlfriend and build a life that neither of us knew before. I promised myself that nothing in heaven or hell was going to get the better of me. And it's funny, it wasn't a force from either heaven or hell that put me in check. Trinity was a ball of endless energy. She tested my inner gangster every day. She got me to punch a few holes in the walls clear signs that I still had a long road ahead of me. As she got older, she just wouldn't slow down. Things changed when she was eight. We were at the park. Trini was running off some energy and me and my wife were enjoying ourselves without having a hyperactive little girl between us. I looked down at my phone to check my email. The same year my daughter was born, I started a construction company, and I was eight years deep in ownership and operation. I should have kept work out of our together time, but I was OCD about making sure my family wouldn't do without. When I looked back up, Trini was flat on her face, on the ground. She wasn't getting up. She wasn't even moving. I raced over to her, calling her name. She wasn't answering. No matter how hard I pushed the gas pedal against the floor of my truck, it never felt like we were going fast enough. There's something about being a parent that made me feel like Trini was always going to be the same size and both of us would live forever. That trip to the ER crushed that notion. She had a rare heart condition that only seven other kids in the country had. Keeping her alive in the short term and keeping her hooked up to an IV connected to a pump that would keep medicine circulating through her heart constantly. She nicknamed it Hubert and told people that he kept her going. Keeping her alive in the long term and finding her a new heart. I didn't know anything about how that world worked. I couldn't understand why they just didn't reach into the freezer and get her one. No. A donated human heart is only viable for four to six hours, which meant that for my little girl to live, someone else would have to die, and soon. But we had to wait. We were put on the list. I got a grip and made myself as optimistic as possible. I pretended that Hubert was a very real part of the family, not just a thin wrench jammed between the cogs of death's machine. I discovered that hope is a finite resource. Hope springs from change. Nothing changed. Weeks turned to months with no news. Other kids on the list got a match, but not Trini. I wanted to get angry over that, but it wasn't anyone's fault. If I had held up the operating room with a gun, it wouldn't have made a difference. Hearts have to not only be moved within a narrow time frame, they also have to be the right size, plus a bunch of other factors that amounted to the cold, bitter truth looking at me and shrugging and saying, that's the way it is. My heart grew heavier as Trini's heart grew weaker. You become a different person without hope no matter how much you have. Without realizing it, I began expecting to wake up to a dead child. I stopped jumping at the sound of the phone. I stopped waiting for relief and waited for an end. One day, like any of the other exhausted and drawn-out days that started to blur together, my phone rang. It was an unknown number belonging to some long string of text, but it included the words Children's Hospital. It certainly wasn't any outfit that we had been in contact with, so I answered. Hello? Hello, I'm trying to reach the parents of Trinity Anderson? Speaking. Oh, wonderful. It is my understanding that your family is waiting on an available heart transplant. Am I correct? 
ouch. It had been so long since I had felt anything like hope that the glimmer of it in my chest hurt a little. Yes, that's true. We're still waiting. Has someone been found? Mr. Anderson, my name is Horace Montague. I represent Osiris Children's Hospital. We do not have a heart to switch out with your daughters, but we do have innovative procedures that may allow her to keep the heart she has. You've been waiting for a matter of months, yes? It felt like it had been years, but it had only been months. Yes, that's correct, I said. Far be it from me to make decisions for you, Mr. Anderson, but I trust that you're running out of time. What do you think you can do for Trinity? Well, it depends on what we find. We work with children who have a variety of conditions, and naturally, each condition calls for a different approach, but our success rate is very high. You're saying she'll be able to keep her heart? Yes, I am. The problem might be something else in the body that's causing the heart to look like the problem. Our approach is very different. That's why you don't hear much about us. My caution left me. Under different circumstances, I would have had a million questions, but by then, every wasted second was a step closer to a death sentence for my daughter. I could only resist the smell of relief and deliverance for so long. We got an address and made an appointment to be seen first thing in the morning. The atmosphere of hope in the car was infectious. I was afraid to let it in. But my wife and my daughter had given into it completely. My wife had a light in her eyes that I hadn't seen since this whole thing started. Trinity suddenly had energy again, as much as you could expect for someone in her position. The driving directions were taking us somewhere remote. I know that having a treatment center or hospital close to nature is supposed to help people get better sooner... But this was isolation on the level of armed and antisocial farmers. The road became surrounded by thick trees, and I was beginning to think that we had been pranked, but the road finally opened up into a well-manicured property. And there it was, the hospital. But there was something different about it. Trinity knew what it was right away. Look, Daddy, a ziggurate. What's that, sweetheart? It's a ziggurat, just like in my book at school. I had no idea what she was talking about, and she didn't explain any further. But the one thing I was certain of was that this hospital wasn't designed like any other. Every hospital I knew was kind of boxy looking. This one was tiered, so that it looked like a blocky pyramid. Two nurses in white coats came outside to meet us. One of them was pushing a wheelchair. Anderson family? One of them said. Yes, we are, I replied. Good, good. We'll give your little one a lift in the chair here. Let us show you inside. Inside, the place looked and felt like most hospitals. The decor had a definite ancient Egyptian slant. A statue at the center of a luxurious fountain had the head of a jackal. The Ankh, that weird cross with the loop hung in every room like the crucifix would in a church-funded hospital. I also noticed that our path was tightly controlled. Nurses and doctors stood as obstacles in corridors that we weren't supposed to take. We ended up in a waiting room with only a handful of other families. A large onk dominated a tiled marble wall. After a few papers and a few waivers, Trinity was being wheeled away as a kindly nurse put her hand on my wife's wrist. She's in very good hands now. Your daughter is going to come out just fine and live a very long time. I couldn't help feeling that she was talking out of turn. I had never heard of a surgery that was guaranteed to be a success, but I appreciated her encouragement. We were politely but firmly dismissed from the building, and then we waited. The following day, I could scarcely believe the words I was hearing over the phone. The procedure was a success. Your daughter is going to be just fine. She looks like she just might live forever. I paused for so long that the person on the other end of the phone thought that the call had dropped. 
Sir? Sir, are you still there? Huh? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Um, when can we come see her? Any time, but the sooner the better. We'll need to keep her for observation, and the sooner you get the visit done, the sooner observation can be gone and out of the way. I wanted to break down in tears and thank them for what they had done for my little girl. For me. Ironically, I was just too spent to make such a display. The fountain was dry. It was different for my wife. As soon as I told her that Trinity was going to be okay, tears flowed and they never fully stopped, not until we got to see her. I wasn't the type to cry myself, and I couldn't stop the water from rising. Not that I had any ego left after that rodeo. All that mattered was that my Trinity wasn't going to die. The weirdness of the place didn't faze me when we stepped inside. A nurse, or an attendant, or whatever, greeted us with the warmest smile. We were led to a room where a round stone platform was raised in the center of the floor, and on it stood my trinity. She had her back to us. I called out to her, and she turned and looked at us. Or rather, she looked through us. I had expected her to greet us with the same energy that we would greet her, I was put off by this strange, neutral energy. My rational side tried to downplay it as a side effect of whatever anesthesia or painkillers she might have had in her system. Mommy, Daddy, she said with zero emotion before staggering over to us. She slid into our arms for a hug. I'm all better now. I couldn't help myself. I picked her up and swung her around. I almost lost her. She was incredibly light, way too light. I was smiling and laughing in her face, and she only stared at me. I looked at the attendant, my joy rotting into concern. She'll be back to her old self eventually. Our procedures uh, take a lot out of a child. How long do you think it'll be before I get to take her home? That's really up to her and how she does. I know how you feel. I'd be anxious if I were you as well. But don't worry, we've gotten her this far. I gave Trinity a kiss on the head and left her in the hands of the people that saved her life. I went to bed expecting to get some kind of phone call the following day. I was back to jumping out of my skin when the phone rang. There was a robocall and a few family members calling to ask about how Trini was faring but the hospital never called. I called them first thing the next morning and got some woman who sounded annoyed. Osiris Children's Hospital, how can I help you? Hello, I'm the father of someone who just had one of your procedures. I'm calling to ask how she's doing. It's Trinity Anderson. Let me look. There was a pause that was too short. That patient is still under observation, sir. Okay, could I talk to her? Patients don't receive phone calls during observation, sir. Please don't worry, we'll put you in touch as soon as she can talk to you. She hung up before I could say anything else. Huh. Waiting for them to call me was agony. I tried to trust that these people knew what they were doing and they knew their job best, but for crying out loud, that's my kid they had. My kid that just barely made it back from the brink of death, you know? A parent can't just distance themselves on command. Not after something like that. But I controlled myself for the rest of the day, ignoring the urge to dial them up and annoy them some more. I even made it to the fourth day without dialing them. That was the longest day of my life. I was staring at my phone. It was all I could do. Even when the TV was on, I just looked at my phone. I didn't read on it, I didn't play games on it or anything like that. I just stared at the phone, the way a coyote stares at a rabbit, waiting for it to move. How I went through the ceiling whenever that phone rang, and how it hurt when I realized it wasn't a call from the hospital. The weekend came and went, and I had made up my mind that there was no reason why I shouldn't get something, not even an update, by a reasonable hour on Monday. Screw it. 
I didn't even wait for them to make the first move. I called first thing in the morning. Hey, it's the father of Trinity Anderson. I would like to speak with her. That's not possible at the moment, Mr. Anderson. I'm sorry. What? Don't tell me she's still an observation. I'm not authorized to speak on the status of our patients. Fine, fine. Put me through to someone that is. Yes, sir, right away. Please hold. I was put on hold, and I was left there. I was on hold for so long that I turned on the speakerphone function and plugged my phone in so it wouldn't die. My confidence in the hospital was wavering. The mind of a parent is a very paranoid thing. Most people that would go through this might think that I had just ended up with the more incompetent staff and I should just chill out. As a father, my brain was firing off in all kinds of directions, like they're trying to cover up some kind of malpractice and buy themselves time. There's a ring of child traffickers operating under the table and they got my daughter. They actually botched the whole procedure and they're trying to get their legal affairs in order before they tell me that my daughter is dead. That kind of cheerful stuff. It truly is a curse. No parent of any fortitude can put up with those kinds of thoughts for too long. I had to do something. If phone calls weren't doing the trick, I'd make a visit. I was squeezing the steering wheel as if it were some medical professional's pencil neck. The last time I was there, they had seemed to have some spark of activity despite how quiet it was. But during that unscheduled visit, the place looked even more like a pyramid. It was as silent as a tomb. I could count on one hand how many vehicles there were in the parking lot, and that was especially strange. It was broad daylight. Windows always look dark during the day, but the windows of that pyramid, that hospital, were especially dark. The front door was locked. Surprise, surprise. They probably saw me coming a mile away. So I went back to my car, basically pretending that I was going to get ready to leave. Then I got back out. I approached the building, but not the entrance. I needed to scope the place out. More than one window blind drew shut as soon as I was in view, so I was still being watched. Still, I decided to hang out for a bit and do some of my own watching. I may as well have been watching grass grow on a grave. One hour became two. I cursed at myself for trying to make a daytime entry. I tried calling one more time and got nowhere. To me, that meant I had to take a literal shot in the dark, so I came back at night. When I could hear the buzz of my wife's gentle snoring, I snuck out. I found a parking space that was shadowed by some trees. I thought for sure that it was going to be a bust like my move during the daylight. The headlights of a lone car cut through the distant darkness and came up the property and found a parking space. It was a small car, but the man that got out of it was huge. He was dressed like he was auditioning for the part of a slave driver in the Ten Commandments. Towering, bald, and wearing something that looked both Egyptian and ancient. There were brass bands around his biceps. I swear his fists were the size of babies. The only modern thing about him, besides the car, was the badge that hung around his neck on a lanyard. He lumbered towards the entrance, and I picked my path through the darkest parts of the parking lot. What was I going to do when it was showtime? Was I going to jump him? I could picture him picking me up and snapping me in two, and using my backbone as a toothpick. He opened the door into the vestibule, and I slid through the door just as it closed with a clack. Like any vestibule, it was dead silent. I was afraid he would hear my footsteps behind his, or hear my breathing, or my heartbeat, or something. But you know what? He badged in. The light next to the lock of the inner door turned from red to green. He went inside, and I slipped behind him again. I couldn't believe it. I felt like I had won the lottery. I hoped, and prayed, that I could get one of those outfits from somewhere inside the building. 
Surely they didn't expect people to dress like that off-duty. The place had seemed strange enough on our first visit when our path was decided for us by the staff, but with nobody to shepherd me along, I was seeing even more strange things. The decorative onks were less child-friendly, coiled with snakes whose tails ran through the eyes of skulls. There were actual torches in some of the halls. They weren't decorative with the LED lights that simulate a flame. No, these were the real deal. Their thick smoke trailed up to be swallowed by the air returns. Only a handful of things were marked with plain English. Everything, and I mean everything, was marked and labeled with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Names of rooms, the bathrooms, or that's what they had to be for sure. Real gold lined the walls, and paintings of things that seemed ancient and dark looked down at me. They all seemed to be telling me that I didn't belong there. The more I explored, the less the place looked like a hospital, and the more it looked like the interior of an ancient pyramid. I rounded a dark corner and came face to face with a man dressed as if he were a guard in Tutankhamun's palace. He even had the eyeliner and the braided hair on his chin. Oh, excuse me, I said, trying to act natural. It didn't work. He raised his glock right to my forehead. My street instincts lit up and I wrapped my fingers around his wrist and sidestepped. A few well-timed twists and the gun was mine. He tried to reclaim it, but I kicked his kneecap and jumped back. The advantage was mine. I waited for him to stop mewling over his knee. Now you listen to me. You're going to take me to my daughter without drawing any attention, or I will kill you. Do you understand me? Yes, I understand you, he said. That voice. You're... you're Horace Montague. In certain situations, yes. Then you know my voice. I'm the father of Trinity Anderson. Take me to her. Now. Follow me. Horace limped along and took me to a large stone door where there was no electric light. Countless torches and candles created living shadows in every corner. He waved his hand across the door, and it slid to the side inside the doorframe, creating a horrible grinding noise. He entered and gestured to me to do the same. It took my mind a moment to process what I was seeing, even though my eyes were registering the sight without any trouble. The walls of the room were invisible, too far away for the dim lights to reach them. There were ranks and files of stone platforms, each of them supporting the body of a child wrapped in white linen. Each platform was surrounded by four ceramic jars. Some of the children appeared to be sleeping peacefully. Others were clearly dead, their ears and noses rotted off, the remaining teeth sprouting from lipless gums. Each stone platform had a hook for a clipboard that bore papers that looked like patient records. The name of each child was prominent. What? What is this? I wondered out loud. My guide turned to look at me. These are our successful patients. They've cheated death thanks to the methods of the ancients. Successful? None of them look like they're alive. Neither are they dead. Their free fall into oblivion has been arrested. The sacred canopic jars contain the stomach, lungs, liver, and intestines of each child as they wait their turn to journey to the afterlife. While my brain was spinning, Horace stopped next to a stone platform that was empty. No child, no jars. The clipboard said, Anderson, Trinity. Oh, look, your daughter's en route to the afterlife now. I forgot. What a pity. You embalmed my daughter? Indeed we did, and you saw for yourself that she still lives. Now, in repayment, she and her canopic jars will be sailing to the lands the living cannot see. Where is she? 
Where is she? The canal to the underworld is in the basement. You won't survive if you go down there. I guess we're going to die together. Take me there. He then said something that sounded like a reply, but I couldn't understand it. Every single child around us stirred. Heads with no eyes lifted their gazes to me. The one closest to me was nothing but papery, crinkling skin wrapped around bone. It shoved itself off of its resting place. Despite the fact that it had no eyes, I could feel the malice in its stare. Its jaw dropped and it said, I was too bewildered to see that Horace had inched closer. He made a grab at the gun, but he was too slow. He staggered back and collided with one of the embalmed children. He didn't get back up. The child did. They were still coming. I became aware of the sound of grinding stone. The door. It was closing. Small hands whipped at me like tree branches as I beelined for the exit. When I reached it, I felt the door against my back and the jam against my chest. I was being crushed, but I had just enough momentum. The basement. I had to make it to the basement. Despite the place's effort to look ancient, there were functioning elevators. No single one ran from the very top to the very bottom, which would figure with the dimensions of a pyramid. One of the elevators spit me out in time to listen to a conversation that I wasn't supposed to hear. The long ship to the underworld's departing is scheduled, yes? Yes, it is. No disruptions on that matter. Good, good. You look pale. Are there disruptions or another matter? The father of one of our patients has forced his way into the building. His daughter is scheduled to leave on the long ship. Shoot him on sight and then he won't be a problem. I bit my lip hard enough to draw blood as I took aim at the two clowns and ended their conversation for them. Two rounds, two hits, two thuds. They were wearing the same ancient rags that Horace was. I stripped off my clothes and changed into one of the outfits with furious speed. The closer I got to the sublevels, the fewer goons stood in my way. Some of them didn't bat an eye when they saw my disguise. One last elevator, a service elevator, sank down, 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 as if it were descending into the digestive magma of the Earth's stomach. The door opened to reveal a subterranean cavern that was so vast it shouldn't have been a reality. There were balconies carved into the walls at dizzying heights. Pyres and censers and braziers belched flames that gave off radiant light but none of it was enough to fully light up the vastness of that cavern. Running down the center of the cavern was a canal. A majestic ancient Egyptian longship was docked. It was one of those things that got bigger the closer you got to it. The sail seemed to have been woven with golden thread, and it shimmered in the gloom. I hoped that I would have time to find Trini before anything major happened. Movement from above caught my eye. The balconies were filling up with those embalmed children. For half a minute, I thought they were coming for me like they had at first, but they were moving in an organized, ceremonial manner. They weren't there for me. They were there for what I needed to stop. I tried to see how far the canal went. It seemed to stretch onward into the infinite. It wouldn't be hard to believe that it was the path to the underworld, this cemented the urgency in which I needed to find my daughter. My thoughts were interrupted as the embalmed children raised their voices to sing, their dry vocal cords intoned a sound that wasn't of this earth. A small army of shadowed figures assembled around the boat. Some were clearly adults. Some wore the ancient Egyptian garb. Some wore clinical white coats and office clothes. And then there was a line, a line of bodies that were all small. Each one pushed a cart that held four jars each. Oh, God, 
if what I had heard was true, each of them were pushing their own stomach, liver, intestines, and lungs. They pushed the carts up a ramp onto the ship. The line kept going and going, like a train that you expect to be done, but it never runs out. Part of me was afraid that I wouldn't be able to recognize Trini, but I knew it was her when the orange and red lights traced out her hair, her nose, the way she walked, her little frame pushing her cart with those jars. At some point, I would have to get on that boat. It appeared to be a focal point of the entire assembly, so I wasn't sure how I was going to be sneaky. Maybe that wasn't even an option. I wondered if my disguise would let me buy a few minutes if I looked like I was some sort of attendant. The train of dead children seemed to have no need of an attendant. I took a chance. As the last of the children walked up the ramp, I followed. There were a few murmurs, but nobody jumped into action. The rush from that little victory set my mind in motion. Okay, next I needed to touch base with my daughter, then get her off that boat, and, and, well, what about those jars that had her organs? Would I need those too? How was I going to rescue my dead daughter before she was completely dead? An existential thread began unraveling in my mind. Rescuing my dead daughter. My unliving daughter. How would she go back to the life she knew with me and her mother? Would she even grow? Would she take her internal organs to school every day? How was this going to work? I felt the boat lurch as it was untethered. A silent, phantom wind filled the golden sail. We were moving. The voices of the children above swelled and droned. Great golden censers flanked the canal at intervals, washing the longship in bursts of light. Trini was standing right next to me, perfectly quiet, perfectly still, just staring at me. Trini, I said. Hello, Daddy. Hey, hey, what are you doing here? I'm going home. Osiris is taking me home. Osiris, huh? That's an important sounding name. He's the god of the dead. Huh. Do you think he would let me take you to your real home? I'm not alive enough to go back with you, daddy. Tears stung my eyes. So, uh, what's Osiris gonna do with a guy like me, you know? I still have my guts inside me, instead of in jars. He might not be happy to see someone living trying to enter, Daddy. You have to be dead to get in. I patted the scavenged Glock in my back pocket. I'm sure I'll be able to work something out with him. You've been listening to Osiris Children's Hospital by Richard Morgan. Richard lives in the Midwest, Riverton, Illinois, very much small-town USA. What better place for writing horror? His crew consists of three cats, two kids, and his wife. He was a cake decorator before he took up writing full-time. Don't worry, none of those cakes were poisoned. He produces his own horror storytelling podcast, Marsh Lights, which can be heard on Spotify and most of the places you get your podcasts, and you can keep up with him and his antics at richardmorganwrites.com. And now, to finish out our evening, I present Fishing Hole by R.K. Combrink. The little blue car buzzed west along Highway 52 under a sky still heavy with pre-dawn darkness. Every so often, other cars would dump onto the road from on-ramps along the way, but for the most part, they had the road to themselves. A steady stream of hillbilly bluegrass jingled and jangled out of the tiny dashboard speakers, and Chris tapped his fingers enthusiastically against the steering wheel in time to the raucous banjo plucking humming along with cheerful abandon. 
His friend, Tony, yawning in the passenger seat, pulled his knit cap down over his ears. He knew it wouldn't muffle anything, but the gesture seemed necessary to him. He was not yet having as much fun as Chris, and he didn't expect to be any time soon. Man, you are gonna shit when you see this spot. Chris's voice was bristling with excited energy. There's only a few people that even know it's there. It's like a legend among these backcountry fishermen. Sweet. Tony's tone was as flat as Chris's was light. He was not a morning person. He enjoyed fishing and being outdoors, but he enjoyed them best in the warmth of a late afternoon sun. He'd said, many times, that as far as he was concerned, heading out at the crack of dawn was for fanatics only. He glanced over at Chris, who was bobbing his head from left to right, a goofy grin plastered across his face as he yodeled along with the music. Tony shook his head and yawned again, leaning forward to grab the steel thermos of coffee from the floor between his ankles. He unscrewed the cap and took a swig, grimacing as the hot liquid burned his tongue and throat. He looked out his window at the rocky hill that sloped up and away to the scraggy pine trees fifty feet above the road. So, where is this place? Chris nodded, and his grin widened as if he'd been waiting the whole ride for Tony to ask. It's up near Brookville Lake. We're gonna have to do some hiking before we get there, but from what Chorbley says, it's gonna be well worth it, buddy. Chorbley was Chris's older brother, whose real name was Wesley. Chris and Tony had spent many beer-soaked days pulling crappy out of numerous unnamed creeks and ponds with him. If anyone would know the location of a legendary remote fishing hole, Chorbley was that person. Chris reached out and turned off the music. We're going to drive into Whitewater, near the lake, and head inwards a ways. There's a few twists and turns, and then we park at the second lot after mile marker 13. That doesn't seem very hidden to me. Tony felt bad as soon as he said it. He knew Chris was excited, and he was acting like a killjoy. The problem was that Chris's brother often exaggerated or outright invented things that had ended up getting them in trouble. The idea that he'd woken up at four in the morning for one of Chorbley's tall tales kept his mood sour. Chris didn't seem bothered at all. Well, after we park, then we get out and head straight into the woods. We gotta be careful we go in a straight line from where we parked or else we'll end up missing it on one side or the other. He reached over to grab the thermos from Tony and took two big gulps. Chorbs says we're supposed to walk through the woods for about a half hour or so, and then we'll come across a rough trail that cuts through to the left. We follow that for a while, and then there's going to be a fork. There's supposedly a little tree trunk with these fish shapes carved into it leading off to the right. That's the trail that leads to the fishing hole. They call it the Trapper's Trail. Tony sighed. That's going to be a lot with all our gear on our backs. Chris cut his eyes at Tony for a moment. Simmer down, Grandma. From what I've heard, this fishing hole is full of some of the biggest catfish you ever saw. A little walking ain't going to kill you. He chuckled and looked back out at the road. Has Chorbley ever been there himself? Tony took the thermos back and had another drink. Dawn began to seep into the sky like blue-gray paint spilled over a black canvas. In the wooded thickets that filled the ravines and valleys along the highway, birds began singing, hesitantly. It was only a few at first, early risers reluctant to disturb the silence, but soon a chorus of chirping and whistling would fill the crisp morning air. Chris shook his head. No, he said he's always wanted to check it out, but every time he was out there, he always forgot about it till it was almost time to pack up and leave. Of course. So how does he even know about it then? Chris shrugged. His friend Link told him about it. Link says his cousin's friend has been out there four or five times and always comes back with an amazing catch. He flipped on the right blinker as they passed under a road sign proclaiming Highway 101 North Next Right. Plus, maybe we'll see the Brookville Spaceman. Tony snorted. <laughs> what? Chris's eyes went wide. Oh man, you've never heard of the Brookville Spaceman? He shook his head. 
That's why you should spend less time in Cincinnati and more time over here. For the Brookville spaceman? Chris laughed at Tony's dubious tone. Yeah, man. See, this whole area up here, Connorsville, Hagerstown, Brookville, the whole Whitewater Valley is a hot spot for all kinds of weird UFO sightings. People see lights in the sky all the time. Sometimes they take pictures of what look like flying saucers. Crazy stuff. Yeah, that's like Gallia County. That's where they saw the Mothman. Tony felt a small bubble of interest beginning to form in his belly. He'd always enjoyed tales of the strange, and this was a new one for him. Chris nodded. Yeah, I guess. But check this. The government dammed up the East Fork of the Whitewater back in the 60s or 70s, and that reservoir is what became Brookville Lake. Some people say that the whole reason they built it is because a UFO crashed up there. Supposedly, there'd been all this activity during this one week. People were calling the sheriff and the news, reporting sightings left and right. Families were camping out in their backyards with old home movie cameras. There were UFO barbecues, UFO slumber parties, UFO swinger parties. It was nuts. So far, Tony was not impressed with this story. Sounds like a boring town filled with bored people looking for an excuse to get crazy. Chris shrugged. Maybe, maybe not. Either way, the story goes that one night, after this had been going on for a while, there was a bright light that lit up the whole sky, and then an explosion out at the park. People panicked, thought it was the Russians or whatever coming to get them. The next day, there were government agents and Air Force guys swarming over the park. Very X-Files. Tony took another swig from the coffee thermos and then poked Chris in the arm with it. Well, if they thought the Russians were invading, I imagine government agents and Air Force guys would probably make sense. Chris rolled his eyes, exasperated. Yeah, except no Russians ever showed up. The sightings started to taper off, and then a few weeks later they started damming up the river to make the lake. Some people, a lot of people, say it was to cover up an alien crash landing. So, sort of like Indiana's version of... What's that town in New Mexico where the spaceship landed? Chris nodded. Roswell. Yeah, kind of like that. So what you're saying... Tony paused to take yet another sip of coffee. Is that the real reason they built Brookville Lake was to hide a UFO crash? Chris laughed. Sure, it's as good a reason as any. The government doesn't want people poking around someplace where they might actually find evidence of aliens, right? He held his hand out for the thermos. What better way to keep that from happening than to fill the place up with water? It's genius, really. So, where does the spaceman come in? Chris finished chugging coffee and handed the thermos back. Well, while they were building the dam, the workers started seeing this weird little hairy man around the work site. He'd show up, somebody would see him, and then he'd disappear. But right after they saw him, stuff would go wrong. There were a bunch of accidents during the construction. I think a couple of people died, and it was always after they saw this little creature. A lot of people think that it was the pilot of the spaceship that crashed, hence the name... Rookville Spaceman. Got it. Tony yawned. Where did you hear all of this? Chris shrugged. I don't know. I guess there's some articles and stuff on the internet about it. Some Native American groups got all bent out of shape and did a bunch of protests because the construction workers accidentally wrecked a bunch of old burial mounds. The local tribe said that the spaceman was really a vengeful spirit. Nobody else really thinks that, though. Everybody basically thinks it's an alien. You've read articles about this. Chris shook his head. No, people just talk about it. Gina swears she knows a guy who says he saw the spaceman when they were camping out by the lake. He said it was the middle of the night and their fire had gone out. They got woken up by these splashing sounds and that something weird came out of the lake, something on two legs and hairy but short, and that it chased them through the woods all the way back to their jeep. She says they never did get their camping gear back. They went back the next afternoon and it was all gone. Tony made a dismissive, psh, sound. 
Yeah, stolen. Chris shrugged again. Maybe. I'm just saying there's a lot of weird stories about those woods up around Brookville. Wouldn't it be awesome to catch a monster catfish and get a glimpse of an alien? The turnoff for their exit appeared, and Chris maneuvered them onto it, heading north. State Route 101 stretched out before them, long, flat fields replacing the rocky hills on either side, rolling off into the distance for miles. It was September, and the sweet corn would be harvested soon. The sky was much lighter now, and rosy sunlight peeked over the horizon. It wouldn't not be awesome, I guess. Tony was finally starting to pep up, mostly, he suspected, because of all the coffee. Still, that gear is going to get heavy. Those fish better be huge, or I'm making you carry everything back out yourself. You're an asshole, dude. <laughs> Chris laughed, reached out, and turned the stereo back on, spilling the frenzied sounds of bluegrass music into the car. The walk through the woods took longer than Chris had expected. By the time the boys found the first trail, the sun was shining high and bright. Choirs of crickets hummed and sang, hidden in the underbrush. They walked single file, enjoying a warm breeze that swept along the path, carrying away the last lingering breath of summer. Their fishing rods and tackle boxes bounced and clacked amiably against their hips as they tromped through the knee-high grass, talking about trivial things like jobs, school, and their frustrating lack of girlfriends. Leafy green bushes pressed in close on either side and pawed at their shirt sleeves as they passed. Time became hazy. They could have been on the path for ten minutes or fifty. Tony was finishing a dirty joke. Sure you can buy me a drink. Just let me put my glass eye back in. When they rounded a bend and came upon the fork in the path that marked the entrance to the trapper's trail. Where the trail diverged, trees had pushed their way up to meet the path. They were shedding their dense gown of leaves, all shades of red, yellow, and orange in defiance of the coming winter. Long, twisting limbs hovered and grasped over the trail, creating a shady tunnel out of each path that branched from the fork. A gray, gnarled stump rose up in front of the right-hand path from roots that sunk into the earth like veins. It was nearly five feet tall and trimmed with furry brown ruffles of fungus. In the center of it, a few inches from the top, was a rough circle where the rippling bark had long ago been scraped away. In this circle was carved an image of two fish facing in different directions. They were simple in design, crude outlines of bodies with mouths open and huge staring circles to represent their unblinking eyes. There it is, the trapper's trail. Chris stepped over to the tree trunk and ran his hand over the carving. Damn, do you know how old this is? Tony shook his head. No, do you? No, man, but it looks pretty fucking old. Chris turned to his friend. Let's get in there and see if the fish are biting. The boys followed the right-hand path under the canopy of limbs and were swallowed up by the gloom. The air was cooler, and sounds gave back a dry, brittle echo. There was no bird song because it seemed like there were no birds flitting to and fro in the branches above. The droning of insects had also been left behind in the sunshine, but there were bugs here. Large black moths fluttered slowly and silently back and forth across the path above the carpet of fallen leaves. Tony eyed them with distaste. Their movements were jerky and sluggish, like little flying zombies. One buffeted his wrist with its powdery wings, and he yanked his arm back with a gasp. Chris looked over his shoulder at his friend. You all right there, Cap'n? Tony rubbed his hand against his jacket. His eyes ticked back and forth across the path, tracking the movements of the moths as they whirled and swooped ahead of him. Yeah, man, I just don't like these bugs. Chris laughed. Oh, come on, man. They're just like butterflies. You're not scared of butterflies, are you? Butterflies are pretty. These things are gross. All right, baby Tony. I'll keep the bad butterflies away so they won't hurt you, okay? Chris's words devolved into a chuckling series of gurgling coos, 
The trail ahead swung sharply to the right, and the brambles and trees huddled thickly in the crook of the bend. Tony found himself looking off into the woods beyond the turn. Suddenly, a dark flicker of movement caught his eye. He stopped walking and scanned the spaces between the tree trunks. Hey, man, did you see that? Chris stopped and turned around. What, was there a ladybug or something giving you shit? Tony waved a dismissive hand at his friend. No, dumbass. Something was running through the woods over there. All of a sudden, he realized how close the forest was pressing in against them and how far from other people they really were. There was no one around to help them if they ran into trouble. Hey, there aren't any coyotes out here, are there? Chris shrugged. Do I live out here? I don't know. He turned around and started walking again. Come on, Grandma, the big bad wolf's with the pigs today. He walked on around the bend and disappeared from Tony's view. Tony lingered a moment longer. His eyes darted from trunk to trunk, trying to catch another glimpse of whatever it was that was moving around. It had seemed large, but not tall. Probably a deer. Tony was sure there were deer back here. He wasn't afraid of deer. Or it was a coyote. Tony wasn't sure how he felt about coyotes exactly. He knew they usually were afraid of people, but the idea of them out here in the woods made him uneasy. As he searched the woods for wild animals, something brushed Tony's hand softly. He jumped and wheeled around. There was nothing there. Then he felt it again, a fluttery, fuzzy tickle against the palm of his hand. He looked down and uncurled his fingers. One of the black moths had blundered into him and was now clinging to his hand with its thick, sticky legs. Tony cried out in disgust and began flinging his hand, trying to dislodge it. The moth seemed to decide it didn't care for this sort of treatment and disengaged itself, wobbling drunkenly away through the air. Another ladybug? Chris's voice lilted back to Tony from somewhere further up the path. Fuck you! Tony shouted. It was a moth! He yanked on the shoulder straps of his backpack and walked on around the bend, nearly running into a stout gray creature standing at the edge of the path. It twitched, but didn't run away. For the second time in less than a minute, Tony screamed. He jumped backward, his gear swaying heavily, pulling him off balance and into a tree. Tony forced his eyes open and tried to get a good look at whatever it was. The thing was still. It was squat, much shorter than Tony, but taller than a deer or a coyote, and broad around the middle. It held its spindly, stubby arms out at odd angles. It looked ancient and hunched, like an old man with very thick, dry skin. It was a tree stump, similar to the one that marked the entrance to the trail. Tony stared hard at it for several seconds. He was sure he saw it move just a little bit when he came around the corner. Chris came hurrying back down the trail, his face full of concern. You all right, man? What the hell's going on back here? Tony gestured with his hand at the tree stump with a heavy sigh. The Brookville spaceman there jumped out at me and said boo. Chris blinked at his friend, nonplussed. What? Tony rolled his eyes. Jesus, I came around the corner and the tree trunk here, he pointed emphatically at the stump, startled me, scared the shit out of me. Chris studied the tree stump and then his friend's pinched expression. See, this is why I brought you on this trip. You need to relax. You see what stress is doing to you? You're seeing things now. Tony nodded. Yes, you're obviously right. He started up the trail, giving the stump one last glare as he passed. Let's get this relaxing over with. After you, my good man. Chris let Tony slink by him and then followed along behind. A few moments later, they stepped out of the shadows of the trapper's trail and into a wide clearing ringed with tall trees. 
Leaves floated to earth with casual grace. The ground was thick with tall yellow grass, weeds, and scrawny shrubs that crouched at the edges of the woods. In the center of the clearing sprawled the fishing hole, a wide, shallow pond, stagnant and green with algae. A fishy, briny odor hung in the air all around. Reeds stood up from the water near the edge and made an eerie whistling sound as a breeze blew across them. The two boys stood still at the mouth of the trail and looked out across the clearing. He didn't know how Chris felt about this place, but Tony was filled with a deep, unsettling loneliness. He could easily believe that only a few people ever made their way back to this spot. It felt like it was its own world, lying in wait beneath its own blue sky within its own strange universe. The air was warm and modile, brushing against their faces and chests in a secretive caress of pond stink. Yowza! Chris tapped Tony lightly on the arm. This is just how Chorbly said it would be. Better, actually. Tony nodded. Yeah? Shit yeah! Come on, Tone, let's check out the pond. Chris strode forward through the clinging grass and underbrush and up to the edge of the water. He unshouldered his pack, letting it drop to the ground, and set the rest of his gear next to it. With his hands planted on his knees, he leaned forward and peered into the murky depths. Tony stood where he was and regarded the clearing and woods beyond with vague disquiet. After a few moments, he joined Chris at the water's edge. Look at him, man! A huge smile played across Chris's face. Sliding, shiny and black, along the surface of the shallow pool were the long bodies of fish, dozens of them, their oily backs rolling and flexing. Tony's lip curled with annoyance. Those aren't catfish, they're carp. He dropped his things beside Chris's gear with a loud, heavy chonk. Rather than being startled by the noise, the slimy creatures continued their slow patrol with hardly a stutter. This close to the water, the odor was overpowering, and Tony's sneer became a grimace. Ugh, and they reek! Chris looked over at his friend, his expression finally sinking into a scowl. Seriously, dude? Is this what you're gonna do all day? Complain? He stood up and straightened his jacket. Because if it's gonna be like that, then we can just leave right now. Leaving was exactly what Tony wanted to do. This weird little clearing and the trail that had led them here gave him bad vibes. He didn't believe in a spaceman running around the woods, but the deep quiet and swaying trees made him uncomfortable. Not knowing why it made him uncomfortable deepened the feeling. He'd been ready to turn around and leave the moment they'd arrived, but he didn't want to disappoint Chris. He knew that Chris had brought him out here in an attempt to stave off the drifting away that had begun with the burgeoning of true adulthood. With Chris going to school in Bloomington and Tony working with his brother in Cincinnati, there wasn't a lot of time for the kind of aimless hanging around that had been the glue of their teenage friendship. Now, to rationalize spending time together and traveling the distance between them, there had to be a plan. Some kind of organized activity that would make the trip worth it. Tony knew, and guessed that Chris did as well, that this gulf between them would only grow wider and deeper. Eventually, it would become a chasm that they would have to work hard to bridge. Tony decided he could bear the anxiety to give his best friend the afternoon he wanted. No, man, I'm just saying that they smell like fish, that's all. He forced a grin. Think it might be because they are fish? Chris laughed and cuffed Tony on the shoulder. Tony chuckled and pointed fat finger at Chris. Your face? The two boys fell into the old rituals of boyhood and unpacked their gear, finding a good flat spot from which to cast. They pulled jars filled with dirt and blind burrowing night crawlers from their packs. Tackle boxes were opened and an array of small items were removed and placed on the ground. Soon, both of them were grasping a fully armed rod and reel and with a flick of their wrists sent their baited hooks into the water. Even though the fish were obviously plentiful and active, none of them were biting. 
The bobbers floated atop the rippling water, jostled by the bodies of greasy carp, but otherwise remained still. Tony imagined his nightcrawler impaled on its hook, watching the carp as they snaked past it, mouths shut. So far, the worm god was coming through for its tiny follower. The day wore on. Chris and Tony had seated themselves several feet apart and facing opposite directions so that their lines did not become entangled. For a while, they kept up a constant patter of conversation, but as the minutes turned into an hour and an hour worked on becoming two, the words dried up and silence filled the clearing. Tony yawned and began reeling in his line. He decided to try a spot a few yards further around the pond. Hey man, I'm going over there to see if it's any better, I'll... As Tony turned to Chris, his words caught in his throat. Chris was sitting there, glumly staring out across the gritty water, pulling at his line. His face showed boredom and nothing more. He seemed completely unaware of the thing that was standing right next to him. It was short, maybe four and a half feet tall. Its head, such as it was, didn't come much above the line of Chris's shoulder. Its body was a mottled gray-black and covered with what appeared to be ribbons of peeling skin. Its arms were thin but wiry with muscle, and its hands were large and flat. The creature's legs were mostly hidden by Chris's body, but Tony could see a long sliver of shin, jet black and smooth, ending in a mound of cracked flesh. It had no face, just a thick fall of long, stringy hair that hung forward from the crown of its head like a wig that had been dragged through a sooty fireplace and then put on backward. There was no hint of a mouth, no indentations to suggest eyes, just the tangle of its scraggly mane. Time stood still, and the whole world went quiet. Tony tried to blink, but his eyelids wouldn't close. He shook his head violently, trying to knock the vision loose. In slow motion, Chris turned and looked back at him, concern spreading across his face. Tony looked up at the sky for what felt like a long time. He was very confident that when he looked back, he would see only Chris eyeing him with confusion. Finally, he let his head swing forward on his neck. There was Chris, setting his fishing rod on the ground, looking at Tony as if he'd gone crazy, and there was the thing standing just behind him. It was actually leaning forward, its grubby little hand resting on Chris's shoulder, its face straining forward as if gauging his reaction to its presence. Time began to catch back up to itself, and sounds came whooshing back with shocking speed. Tony began screaming. Uh, behind you! He pointed at Chris, who whirled around violently and ducked as if to evade an oncoming blow. The thing took its hand away from his shoulder, but otherwise held its position. Tony kept giving voice to hoarse cries as Chris turned to him with agitated eyes. What, man? What is it? A bee or something? A wasp? Before Tony could answer, Chris hopped to his feet and whipped his head all around, searching for the stinging insect that could be the only thing Tony was yelling about. The faceless creature, small, silent, and very much still there, cocked its head. It didn't reach for him or approach, but its blind scrutiny fell upon him with a thick sense of malice and rage. You are in a bad place. The thought wormed its way into his brain as if it had been whispered into his ear. You are in my place. Chris, meanwhile, realized that there was no bee or wasp. He didn't see the thing, didn't sense it, even though he was standing less than a yard away from it. It had been touching him, but he had no idea it was there. The thing seemed to ignore Chris completely. All of its malignant intent seemed focused on Tony. What the fuck, man? Chris looked down at Tony, his hands held out, exasperated. 
What is your deal? Tony's eyes flicked away from the creature. The spaceman. Holy goddamn shit, it's the Brookville spaceman. And up into Chris's accusatory, gape-mouthed stare. When he looked back, the spaceman was no longer there. Had it ever been? Tony looked down at himself, discovering the cringing position he'd worked his body into. Suddenly, his cheeks and ears were burning with embarrassment. Chris stood a few feet away, awaiting an explanation. Tony looked around the little glade, his eyes panning the trees and bushes, the reeds growing up from the water. He saw whispering grass and the pond itself, rippling with the slowly drifting scum of algae. It was gorgeous. Everything was tinted with the strong light of early afternoon. No creature besides the fish and the two boys disturbed the placidity. What just happened? He climbed slowly to his feet, brushing invisible dust from his pants and jacket. He glanced at Chris, abashed. Sorry, dude. I just got a little freaked out. Chris's eyebrows went up. You think? He made an exaggerated show of looking around the clearing, his hands planted on his hips. You want to tell me what it is you thought was happening? Did a tree trunk try to sneak up on me? A great wave of exhaustion drained through Tony. All his breath seemed to have been sucked out, and he felt his legs weaken. He crumpled to the grass, his legs crossed in front of him. He dragged the knit cap from his head and shrugged, forcing a small, cracked smile. I don't know. I guess... I guess I thought I saw the Brookville spaceman or something. He watched, eyes cast sidelong, for Chris's reaction. What? Chris had a confused and somewhat nervous look on his face. Again? Are you serious? No, I don't know. Tony sighed, looking at the ground, wanting to lie down in the scraggly grass. I think I fell asleep for a minute and dreamt it. I'm really tired. He actually thought that this was probably true. Looking back now, at the past minute or so, it seemed highly unlikely that he'd seen anything at all. Fatigue was dragging him downward, pulling his eyes shut. He yawned. It had been an early, very early, start for him, and he'd been tired all day. He'd pounded coffee the whole drive and then carried his pack and gear a few miles through the woods. It made sense that after all that, as he relaxed in the warm sun, he might crash with fatigue. Chris grinned and shook his head. Oh man, you are one fucked up little monkey. You know that? He laughed. Tony laughed along with his friend. Yeah, man, that was really weird. He yawned again, covering his mouth with the back of his hand. Uh, I think this week's just catching up with me. I might just, you know, lay back and shut my eyes for a few minutes. Chris hunkered down and settled himself back in his spot at the edge of the pond. He picked up his rod and began reeling in line. Do whatever. I just wanted to get us out here to relax. A nap's as good as fishing, as far as I'm concerned. His hook came up from the water, dripping and wormless. He sighed and turned to find his jar of bait. Meanwhile, I'm going to keep trying to pull one of these monsters out of there. Tony nodded wordlessly and curled up on his side, pressing his face into the crook of his curled arm. Clover tickled his cheek and nose. He was already sinking rapidly into sleep and barely heard Chris speak. All that screaming he did, you'd think all the fish would have gotten scared away. They didn't even flinch. It's weird. Yeah, weird, Tony thought, and then sleep overtook him. Tony awoke, pushing himself up to a sitting position and wiping drool from his cheek and chin. Afternoon had slipped into dusk. It was cooler in the clearing, and the shadows had deepened into a gray gloom. Above him, the undersides of the clouds had turned a rusty red-orange, and the trees were featureless black cutouts grasping at the sky. Shit, Chris, why didn't you wake me up? We're gonna have to go soon. 
Tony's head felt heavy, his brain sloshing around inside his skull. His eyes were still fighting to stay open. When he got no response, he looked over to Chris's spot on the bank. Did you hear me? Chris wasn't there. His rod and reel were there, lying on the ground. The line stretched out into the pool, which had turned black in the early evening darkness. His tackle box and backpack were still there. His jar of night crawlers sat lidless, plump pink bodies writhing through the loosened soil at the top, smearing the glass with slime. Chris? Tony gazed out across the water to the trees that crowded together on the other side. There was no answer. Fuck. He twisted around and looked behind him. Chris was standing across the clearing at the mouth of the trapper's trail, facing him. At least, I think that's Chris. It was hard to tell. He was standing beneath the overhanging arms of a spindly pine tree, bathed in shadow. Who else would it be? Tony scrambled to his feet. You all right, man? Chris didn't answer. He just stood there, facing Tony. Nervousness fluttered in Tony's belly. He took a few reluctant steps toward the figure that was obviously Chris. There's nobody else back there. Nobody really knows about this place. Suddenly, Tony's dream from earlier tried to push its way into his mind. The thing, spaceman, crouching behind Chris, watching him with expressionless hatred, dissecting him with its faceless gaze. A chill snaked down the nape of his neck. He shoved back at the unwelcome thought by pretending to be irritable and hungry. Dude! He called out to Chris, forcing his feet to carry him forward. We ever gonna get some food or what, man? Of course that's Chris. Duh. That's his stupid army jacket. Still, there was no reply. Three more steps and Tony became genuinely irritable. Dude! Another four steps. Still no answer. Dude! Two more steps. Silence. Chris! Asshole! Answer me! When Chris shambled out from beneath the shadows of the pine, Tony didn't quite grasp what he was seeing. There was something wrong with Chris's face. Is he hurt? Did something happen to him while I was sleeping? That might explain Chris's odd behavior. Maybe he was dazed or even in shock. Chris was getting closer, not hurrying, but closing the short distance rapidly. Tony could see him clearly, but still couldn't understand what was wrong. Dimly, in the back of his mind, the creeping terror of what his eyes were communicating began to thaw his paralysis. All at once, he understood the problem with Chris's face, and he staggered back a few steps with the shock of it. Chris had no face. There was only a thick mop of ashy hair swinging to and fro as the spaceman staggered and hunched towards Tony, a little unstable in its new Chris body. It held out its arms, Chris arms that ended in Chris hands, and reached for Tony. Tony's fight-or-flight response took command of his body and ordered flight. He began backpedaling, his arms pinwheeling madly as he stumbled away from the apparition that had nearly reached him. It made no noise. This was in sharp contrast to the howling cries that had begun tearing from Tony's lungs and out his tortured throat. As he retreated into the clearing, Tony lost his balance and nearly tumbled to the ground. As it was, he managed to halt and bend backward further than he would have dreamed possible, one leg dangling in space. He teetered on the edge of declivity for a second or two and then righted himself, planting his wayward foot back on the ground. He spun around, ready to launch into a sprint, when his feet tangled in Chris's abandoned fishing gear. The toe of his boot slipped under the lid of the tackle box, yanking it from the bank and sending it hurtling into the pond where it splashed loudly. Tony couldn't recover this time and went sprawling to the ground, 
He put his hands out to catch the worst of the impact and rolled away from the pond. He was moving on pure instincts now. As he rolled, he saw the spaceman thing lunge with Chris's body at the spot he had vacated a millisecond earlier. It had somehow closed the distance in the blink of an eye. With a yelp, Tony heaved himself up and barreled forward, his heavy, frenzied steps hammering the grass and leaving deep ruts. He didn't look back to see if the thing was able to stop its dive and recover itself. He pounded toward the opening of the trapper's trail. In the few seconds between falling and regaining his footing, Tony had gotten the idea that if he could outrun the spaceman and get beyond the other end of the trail, maybe he would be safe. Like Ichabod Crane riding across that covered bridge before the headless horseman could catch him. Tony seized on this idea, grasping it in his mind with desperate, crazy hope. This was his mission, his salvation, to get to the other end of the trail. He never bothered to consider what would happen if the plan should fail. It didn't matter. He ran. It only took a few seconds for Tony to reach the mouth of the trail. He smashed through the underbrush, heedless of the brambles and thorns, and plunged into the thick gloom. He ran headlong at the same breakneck pace till he reached the spot where the tree stump had startled him earlier that day. Somehow he wasn't surprised to find that it was no longer there. A thicket of twisted briar bushes stood there instead. Some part of Tony's mind knew he wasn't mistaken about its location. It had been there, beside the path, just after he and Chris had come around the bend. He slowed to a jog and then to a standstill. There was the bend just a few yards ahead, but there was no sign of the gnarled tree stump. His breath tore in and out of his lungs. His chest, shoulders, and thighs all burned. He allowed himself a few painful gasps before shooting a terrified glance back over his shoulder. He expected to see the spaceman thing standing a few yards down the path, studying him with that unnerving stillness that somehow conveyed such poisonous fury. For the moment, the trail was clear. He was alone. Standing still in the growing darkness, Tony allowed the last few minutes to catch up to him. He covered his face with his hands and emitted a shaky sigh that turned into a squeal of fear. Where was Chris? What happened to him? Tony began pacing in a tight little circle there on the path. How come this didn't happen to everybody that saw the spaceman? He suddenly recalled Chris mentioning someone being chased by something while they'd been camping out here. Maybe this did happen to everyone who saw it, or at least everyone who invaded its territory. Tony abruptly shoved these thoughts away. All that mattered was getting out to where he could find other people. He briefly considered going back to the clearing to hunt for Chris, but dismissed the idea almost immediately. He told himself that it probably wouldn't help, but the truth was that even thinking about going back there filled him with such a sickening dread that his breath caught in his chest. There would be plenty of time for rationalizing later. He could always return with a heavily manned search party. For now, he and Chris would have to tend to their own situations. Tony strained and listened for any noises that would indicate something moving around out there in the dark. It was hard for him to hear over the din of his heartbeat slamming in his ears, but so far, no obvious sounds revealed themselves. Slowly, he began creeping along the path towards the bend. His head bobbed and jerked like a bird's as he tried to see in every direction at once. The gathering darkness pressed down around him, creating an ever-shrinking box of visibility. Tony knew he needed to get off this trail as quickly as possible. All of his muscles tightened as he approached the bend. Like a person who can't swim that jumps into water to escape a fire, Tony forced himself to turn the corner, throwing his arms up in front of his face to ward off whatever might be waiting. Nothing was waiting. He could see through to the other end, 
pale blue twilight, shockingly brilliant against the funereal gloom of the trapper's trail, waited fifty yards away, beckoning to him, wanting to congratulate him on his narrow escape. Fifty running steps. His painful scowl began to melt into something that was almost a smile. He turned to take one last look behind him before racing towards the waning but welcoming light. If anyone or anything was on the trail behind him, they were far back, wrapped in a cocoon of shadows. Tony turned back, and the path was still clear. He began jogging towards the end of the trapper's trail. In just a few more seconds, he'd be out there, on the path back to the woods and then the parking lot beyond. He wasn't looking forward to making the trip back by himself with night stealing over the park, but he would hurry and he would only look straight ahead. He would just focus on getting to the car, quickly and safely. Thinking about the car made him think about Chris. Poor, lost Chris. Should I have gone back? No. He nodded to himself firmly. Chris wouldn't have wanted him to risk going back into the heart of the spaceman's lair, not if he had a clear escape route. If Chris was still out there, and still himself, he would understand Tony's actions. Tony was sure that Chris would have done the same thing in his place, and Tony would have wanted him to. I'm sorry, Chris. He blinked back sudden, uncertain tears. I'll come back for you. Only a few more yards to go. Tony could see the edge of the tree stump with a fish carved into it. When he returned, with many, many more people in tow, he would bring an axe to cut that fucking thing down. Nobody else would be able to use it as a landmark to find their way back to that nightmare pond. Suddenly, up ahead... Something stepped out from behind a tree just outside the mouth of the trail, blocking it and shutting out most of the light. Most, but not enough to hide the shaggy drift of hair that topped the shoulders of Chris's old army jacket. Tony was moving too fast to stop before the thing strode forward. Without time even to scream, Tony's body collided with the completely solid, completely real body that had been appropriated by the thing that had fallen from the sky and now haunted these woods. When they ran into each other, it didn't so much as stagger back a step. It wrapped his friend's arms, arms Tony had punched jovially thousands of times, around his body and hugged him to itself. Tony shrieked. His breath stirred the dank hair that hung just inches from his face. The creature's head cocked to the side, curiously, and finally it began to speak. Stilted, garbled gibberish uttered in a deep, black tone. Tony couldn't understand what it was saying, but somehow pictures began to form in his mind. Awful pictures. They began crowding out the thoughts and memories and dreams and emotions that made up who Tony was. His last thought before sliding into the darkness forever was to wonder how it could without a mouth. You've just heard Fishing Hole by R.K. Combrink. R.K. Combrink is a writer and artist who lives in Cincinnati, Ohio with his wife and two sons. He is a founding cast member of the popular horror podcast, Night of the Living Podcast. He enjoys iced tea, unsweet, and genuinely believes in Sasquatch. You can find more of his work through his publisher, Velux Books, www.veloxbooks.com. Well, listeners, I'd say that ties a nice bow on our evening tonight. 
Mr. Anderson is on his way to the underworld, and our friends Chris and Tony have been absorbed into the consciousness of a backwoods monster. All seems right in the world to me. Thanks to Richard Morgan and R.K. Combrink and Velux Books for providing tonight's stories. I'll be back next week with another story from R.K. Combrink, so be sure to tune in at the same day and time. Until then, friends, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you are after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. (laughs) 